We're here now with Chance Finucane. He is the CIO of Oxbow Advisors, and uh, he is here to discuss with us exactly what's going to happen this week with the Federal Reserve, how markets should react, and how you should allocate your portfolios accordingly for the medium and long term. Chance, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on, David. Chance, we've had uh, the founder of Oxbow Advisors, Ted Oakley, on several times. Uh, great guest, one of our fan favorites on Kitco. So I'm excited to get you on now. You are the uh, man behind the numbers we were talking offline. So excited to get your take on the stock markets, your outlook on the Federal Reserve, the macroeconomic landscape, and gold. Let's talk about the Fed first. That is a big headline of the week. So meeting going on right now. They're expected by the markets to raise interest rates by 75 basis points. Uh, they're expected to release uh, that decision tomorrow. What is your expectation, Chance? That's our expectation as well, 75 basis point hike to be announced tomorrow. I think where everyone's focused is going to be the commentary of Jay Powell. And it seems as if investors and some parts of the mainstream media are really hoping for the pivot uh, where you start to see uh, the Fed become more dovish. But we actually think that uh, Powell has been pretty consistent during the year trying to focus solely on bringing down inflation. And whether that means he's setting up a 50 basis point hike in December or a 75 basis point hike, we would expect his commentary to continue to be focused on trying to bring down inflation and catch up uh, short term interest rates, especially up to that core PCE inflation number that is still slightly above 5%. Okay. And um, long term, do you think they'll be able to tame inflation? As uh, Federal Reserve Jerome Powell, uh, Chair Jerome Powell, has uh, indicated that he wants inflation to go back to 2%. That is his target. How likely is that to happen in the foreseeable future, Chance? It's interesting because they always are trying to project out a return to 2% inflation within 12 months or so. And every time you see the updated estimates from the Fed, they're always just changing the goalpost, but always having to come back to 2% just a year later. And we would expect that it might be a bit more difficult. Uh, it's a bit of a blunt tool that the Fed has to try and bring down demand uh, around the world and slow down the economy and have that be the reason why inflation comes down. So we do expect inflation to decelerate, but that might mean that inflation is still at 7 to 8% this quarter, might be between 6 and 7% in the first quarter next year. And then really still four or five percent at the uh, the midpoint of next year. So it may take a bit longer or a bit more effort than they'd like to uh, to get back to that two percent number that they want things to be at. Well, four to five percent is still a significant decrease from current levels, as you've mentioned. What would cause this deceleration? We think it would just be really a focus on them continuing to try to bring down demand. We actually think uh, the first half of next year is going to be when you really see more of a slowdown in economic activity. Right now, the consumer has stayed resilient enough spending on services and drawing down on their personal savings. And we think that will continue to be somewhat uh, OK through the holidays. But by the first half of next year, we think things might uh, be pretty difficult in terms of generating economic growth. And if you look at history, that tends to be a driver of bringing down a uh, inflation just if you've got very little growth to speak of around the world. I'm going to share with you a viewpoint uh, that's been brought up to me, and uh, I'd like you to comment on this. Uh, there is a view that there is nothing the Federal Reserve can do that can bring down inflation. There's two reasons for this. One, if you take a look at the uh, percentage of uh, 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 percentage increase of rates uh, that's going up, it's rather insignificant compared to historical levels. So even though they are raising rates at a very fast pace, the rate of change is high, the absolute level is still very low. Compare that to the Volcker days when uh, Volcker raised interest rates to double digits to combat double digit inflation. So we're nowhere near 8% interest rates, which is some would argue is needed to bring down 8% inflation. That's number one. Number two, uh, you know, the Federal Reserve can control monetary policy, but they can't control directly supply chain issues that are exacerbating inflation. For example, in the U.S., there's a diesel shortage that's going on currently. Some would argue that uh, fuel shortages, energy crises could continue this inflationary pressure on the ordinary citizen. And so that's not something the Fed can control. That's just something that uh, the economy needs to work out over time, or perhaps we need to produce more oil, whatever the case may be, not within the Fed's control. How would you respond to those two points? I think those points are fair. Uh, when you look at, especially in the energy market, uh, right now, it, if other commodities, there's been a significant uh, fall off in price. If you're looking at more industrial metals, uh, 
But in terms of oil and natural gas, uh, especially in oil, that stayed up probably a little bit more than the Fed and the, the government really would expect based off how much they've tried to raise interest rates. And to your point, going uh, up by nearly 400 basis points in a year, that's pretty sizable move. But we saw larger uh, tightenings in policy during the Volcker era in the 1970s and early 1980s. Uh, but it is a bit of a shock to the system. So you would expect oil prices to come down maybe more even than they already have. And yet, because there's not enough, enough new supply being generated, uh, and you might get some additional stimulus or some additional demand coming either from China next year, if they started to open up their economy a bit more, if the US stopped trying to release reserves uh, from their strategic reserves. Uh, and then there's just a little bit more demand every year for fossil fuels. Uh, all of those factors could lead to uh, oil prices staying up a little bit longer than you think. And that would be an issue for the Fed that's really trying to get back down to 2%, but to your point, not entirely in their control and uh, may lead to this being more of a longer drawn out issue. Well, uh, Jerome Powell is not Paul Volcker. How high do you think the Fed funds rate could go before they eventually pivot? Well, right now, what's expected is that they'll be able to get the Fed rate up to 5%. Uh, first, let's see if we can get there without something breaking in the financial system. Uh, you saw the issues that were happening in the UK with their pensions. Um, they were able to somewhat resolve that, even though the UK rates are still quite high. Uh, but if they can get up to 5% without anything significantly breaking, uh, they definitely could try to get there. We saw some reports that they could try to get up to 55 or 6% uh, on the Fed funds rate, but we wouldn't expect that at this time. And that would also create issues where the amount of interest expense that the U.S. government would have to pay on that as you have to start to issue new debt uh, to replace the debt that's maturing, that interest expense is going to increase substantially and would be a problem in terms of a, a budget deficit issue. So you, that's not really a long term plan for them. And do you expect Treasury yields to continue to go up as well? We think as much as yields have gone up throughout the past year, uh, most of that damage for bond investors has probably already been done. Uh, okay. Right now, you've got short-term treasury yields at about 4.5%. On the longer end of the curve, it's more around 4%. Uh, you could see uh, a rise where, let's say, they get the, the Fed funds rate up near 5%. That means the two-year yield will probably go up to about 5% as well. And then you can see the 10 year and 30 year yield rise from four up to about four and a half in that scenario while still maintaining that inversion versus the short term rates. So there might be a little bit further to go, but uh, we think most of this rise has already happened. OK, uh, just want to pull up a few charts and uh, comment on these charts here. The first one showing the 10 year yield. Now, as you can see in this chart, uh, the 10 year yield started moving around uh, uh, mid 2021 or, or late 2020. Um, this is in contrast to the short end of the curve, the two year yield, which only started moving much later. So if you go to the two year yield now, you'll see that the two year yield only started moving up around uh, 2022. And, uh, you know, before we comment on the uh, yield curve, why do you think that the uh, short end of the curve moved a lot later than the long end of the curve? and more dramatically at that when it did start moving? The long end of the curve tends to move more with what the market sets the rate at, what they expect inflation expectations and real GDP growth to be. And so the fact that you started to see the 10-year rate move up in late 2020, we would view that as a response to uh, all of the fiscal and monetary stimulus that, that was being put out into the system. And maybe a response, especially uh, after the vaccine announcement in November of that year, uh, realizing that inflation was going to accelerate, mm. growth was going to accelerate. And so that would be why the market moved first. On the opposite side, the short end of the yield curve, say two years or less, tends to move a lot more with Federal Reserve policy. So because the Fed was still providing QE all the way through 2021 and into the beginning of 2022, it took a while for the two-year rate to start to move up because you had no telegraph by the Fed that they were going to start increasing rates yet. But once you got within about six months uh, of that uh, ending of QE in March 2022, I think that's when you started to see the two-year start to drift up.
It's interesting because the 10-year, again, I, as, as we pointed out, started drifting up around uh, late 2020. Back then, there was still a bull rally in the stock markets and all risk assets, actually, including cryptocurrencies. It wasn't until the two years started drifting up or moving up dramatically. It wasn't even a drift. It was a spike up like a rocket ship around uh, late 2021 that the equities markets and the cryptocurrency markets, basically risk assets, started falling. And we've been in the bear market ever since. Generally speaking, Chance, what is the relationship between yields and the stock market? It's interesting now because so many investors, uh, they, they have an Excel spreadsheet for their models. They were right. taught this in, right. in business school, like, oh, you got to adjust your discount rate. Yeah. And yeah. if your, your short-term interest rates, the risk-free rate goes up, that's going to naturally lower the, the future cash flows of these businesses you're thinking about investing in. And it almost seems like it's been a very expected response where valuations have come back down as the Fed began to raise rates and say they were going to raise rates further. Uh, so I, I'd say it's a pretty expected response. And that really hurt the businesses that don't generate much in the way of free cash flow today. And uh, you're really banking on this great future outcome. Those are the ones that have really been hit the most by rates moving higher. You don't really adjust your discounted cash flow every single day, though. Well, maybe you do, but I mean, you 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 factor in your assumption for your two-year yield or your five-year, whatever whatever the case may be that your input that you're using. But you know, it seems to me that valuations were continuously adjusted downwards over the last three quarters or so, which is reflected in the stock prices, right? You would think that people would expect rates to go up and then adjust it once, and that would be the end of the correction. But that wasn't the case, Chance. Yeah, I think there's a couple of points there. So first, I don't think investors were prepared for how much rates mm -hmm. have increased. Mm -hmm. And just looking at the last 12, 13 years, uh, you never saw them really being able to get the the 10 year yield above two or 3%. And, uh, and they certainly couldn't get the Fed funds rate above that. So I think getting to where you're at four or four and a half, potentially 5% has really shocked investors and had to recalibrate. And from our perspective, uh, free cash flow generation has really become, in our mind, the, the top predictor of how these valuations are moving for specific stocks. Even right. if you say a company's got a lot of EBITDA or, or something, you know, some uh, generic metric like that, if their free cash flow is not there, then you're going to see that valuation come down. Uh, Chance, let's take a look at uh, how companies have historically performed in the wake of rising interest rates. One of the themes of this year and beyond is the end of zero interest rates. You'll recall that we've had near zero interest rates for a very long time, Chance. In this environment, when we have rising rates and rising fast, which sectors tend to outperform, which, sector, which sectors tend to underperform the most? Well, when you have rising rates like this, it tends to be as we're experiencing a more inflationary environment. So that typically leads to good results for energy, certain materials businesses, although a lot of those materials businesses have rolled over because commodity prices outside of energy have been coming down for the past six months. Uh, you could also, in a normal yield curve environment, it would be a good environment for financials. The problem is you've got an inverted yield curve so it, it creates a difficult dynamic for uh, paying short-term deposits and then lending long for banks or for other insurance businesses. So it hasn't maybe been quite as beneficial for banks as uh, maybe they would have liked if you mm -hmm. would have told them that rates were going to start going up this year. That's right. uh, but uh, where you see on the opposite side is, especially in recent months, uh, there's been a lot of pain uh, for utilities and REITs, uh, those two sectors. Uh, and that's just because of rising rates uh, those are businesses that cap rates for commercial property. And then utilities is a bit of a bond uh, surrogate or proxy that you might want to own instead of bonds. But now that you can get a, a four and a half percent one year treasury yield, do you really want to own a utility that only pays a three percent dividend? So okay. those are conversations that investors have not had for a long time, but now can start making those comparisons and may decide that they want to take some risk off the table and move things uh, more towards short term treasuries. Looking at the chart of the yield curve, in the past, whenever the yield curve reaches zero, that tends to lead a recession by six to eight months. Now, the yield curve reached zero back in July for the second time this year, and it's been a negative territory ever since July. So that's, you know, five months already, almost five months of negative uh, uh, territory for the yield curve. Are we in a recession? It's, it's undecided because the National Bureau of Economic Research, 
which is the organization that designates recessions, they haven't come out and officially assigned this period as a recession yet. So there's been some political back and forth as to whether or not this actually is a recession. How would you characterize this economic environment? If the yield curve is any indicator at all, we should be in a recession very soon, right? Sure. So uh, while I understand that the first two quarters of this year was more technical reasons why you had real GDP growth be negative. Uh, first, it was due to net exports. And then in the second quarter, it was due to the way inventories were being adjusted from quarter to quarter. But if you end up with two negative quarters in a row, in our mind, that would be a recession, even if it was just a mild one at the start of this year. Uh, what we think the yield curve, uh, the two-year and 10-year inversion there, and then real recently, the inversion between the three-month rate and the 10-year rate, what that's uh, forecasting for us is the recession, whether you want to tie it all together or say it's a second recession in this period, uh, coming in the first half of next year. We think that's going to be a difficult environment. And the two-year, 10-year inversion tends to happen a little bit earlier than the three-month, 10-year. But that uh, inversion between the three-month treasury and the 10-year treasury rate, I believe it's eight for eight in predicting recessions going back about half a century. And so the fact that we're sitting in that environment right now and, and that inversion may even get steeper uh, as short-term rates continue to rise uh, would portend a, a difficult environment going into the next year. All right. So let's take a look at how this affects uh, equity valuations and prices in particular. You have this table showing uh, historical PEs, uh, forward PEs during past recessions. So low PE in recession is 11 to 13 times. Uh, now, just taking a look at uh, 2007 to 2009, the 2008 recession, for example, the start uh, of the uh, of the recession was 15 uh, and it contracted to 10. So typically multiples contract by according to your table, 2.6 to 5, uh, 12 in the case of the dot-com bubble. Well, what are we looking at currently, Chance? What, 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 are we, what are we expecting for this recessionary cycle? Well, what we looked at or what was most interesting to us in that chart, uh, which came from Rosenberg Research, was the end point. So in those major recessions, uh, when you really had a capitulation among investors uh, and a drawn out bear market and recession, you typically ended up between 11 and 13 times forward earnings. And so for us right now, uh, we're at 16 and a half times earnings today. Uh, so it tells you I mean, for the long term, if you looked at a 30 year history of forward price to earnings ratios, 16 to 17 times is average. And you typically don't bottom in the market at an average valuation. You typically have to go through the average to a, a below average level, the same way that you peaked at an above average level. So we would be looking for uh, more panic in terms of selling by investors that gets us to a valuation closer to those levels. And the other piece of this is earnings expectations to us are still too high for next year. Mm -hmm. uh, it's interesting. Everyone responded very positively to Apple's earnings report last week, and uh, we still own Apple for clients. We, uh, we think it's a fantastic business, but we think expectations are still a bit too high for next year, considering that uh, earnings growth is expected for a business that still sells tech hardware and uh, has its services growth uh, slowing down, being only 5% in the most recently reported quarter. So if you think valuations, uh, in particular, the P.E. ratio is going to contract even more to underneath or below the average level, which is what we're currently at, what does that translate to prices? How far do we have left to go for the S&P 500, for example, to correct before we hit rock bottom valuations? Well, we're always evaluating it kind of in real time. So for most of this year, our, our starting point is we just need to see the S&P 500 start drifting down towards about 3,400 uh, at the very least. And then you can start coming up with combinations of a, of a PE ratio and an earnings uh, number for the S&P 500. They could get you into the low 3,000s. Uh, we see more um, apocalyptic type scenarios mm -hmm. that are put out. Have you falling into the 2,000s? Uh, it's certainly possible, considering that we've had 50% declines in the market uh, several times in the last 50 years, and that would take you from 4,800 down to the, the mid-2000s. Uh, I don't know that we go that far, but just looking at this directionally, if we're still at the high 3,000s in the S&P 500 today, that just tells us that we don't think this is done. And the fact that earnings expectations are still too high for next year tells us that um, people haven't really factored in the recessionary environment that we may still be dealing with in 2023.
Okay. If you take a look at 2008, for example, things started collapsing around uh, fall 2008 and it troughed around, I believe, the, uh, the spring of 2009. That's about a roughly six to seven month, I'm ballparking, roughly a half a year period of a bear market. We've already seen that chance. So uh, what are the chances that we're going to get a rebound from here? is basically what investors are wondering. Because if you just take a look at historical precedents, again, 2008, for example, you know, we've already kind of exceeded the uh, usual length of a bear market before things trough, have we not? Actually, I don't think we have for this sort of a drawn out okay. bear market. In that example, you cite the, the high, like we just had the high made basically New Year's Day of this year. So we're about nine or 10 months into it. Uh, the high in that great financial crisis was October of 2007. So that was an 18 month bear market essentially before you bottomed. Uh, we're only halfway into that. Uh, same thing in the dot com bubble. We peaked in March of 2000, didn't hit a final low until March of 2003. It took three years. Um, and then the previous one everyone cites uh, was 1973 and 74, and that was a nearly two year bear market. So uh, it could go well into next year. And uh, it's something that we're constantly monitoring because if you do see a full capitulation where now investors panic too far, we want to be sure that we're a step ahead and, and we're ready to take advantage of that. But as of now, we think the environment is still a bit too complacent among investors. Okay. Right. Well, so uh, looking ahead then, asset allocation, if you're bearish in the markets and uh, you think that uh, there's probably more downside ahead before things rebound, how are you positioning your portfolio chance? Sure. So in our income strategies, uh, we have a large allocation uh, to short term treasuries that are generating a four or four and a half percent yield. Uh, we think that's a safe spot to be just because so many areas of risk assets we think still have downside ahead. Um, given what's happening right now in the oil market and our high income strategy, we also still have some exposure to energy, not as much as we did at the beginning of the year, but uh, we still like owning some pipeline businesses and uh, I've added a couple small positions in some other energy companies like Devon Energy or Pioneer Natural Resources uh, just to have exposure in case you see the oil price really rise in the quarters ahead. Uh, it's still kind of on the fence as to how the oil price is going to move here in the months to come. Uh, and then last area there would just be a focus on uh, some high quality preferred stocks that can generate some good yield. And then okay. in the stock market side for our, our equity portfolios for clients, we're positioned very conservatively, probably as, as conservative as we've been in over a decade, uh, where we've got, again, about half of the portfolio in uh, short-term treasuries, just generating some yield. And the remainder in an assortment of very high quality businesses that have consistent cash flow, high profit margins, and great balance sheets. And uh, those would be businesses like Visa or MasterCard, O'Reilly Auto. Uh, areas that we think are going to be able to get through this period okay and uh, that we don't think we're overpaying for. Okay. Uh, what about uh, the tech side? Now, uh, back in 2020, when we had a major correction, tech stocks actually did very well, uh, rebounded quite, uh, quite significantly thereafter. Well, of course, the entire market's rebounded, but uh, tech stocks in particular, you would think that uh, people would stop spending money during a pandemic, but in fact, they went... Uh, you know, they dove headfirst into online retailers, things like Amazon uh, skyrocketed. What about this time around? Do you think subscription services, not like Amazon, but it's things like, uh, um, you know, Netflix, things like uh, Apple Music, uh, perhaps even video game companies that you have to pay a monthly subscription to. Do you think those will falter during an economic downturn? It's a new environment for them, and it'll be interesting to see what consumers decide to keep versus what they decide to get rid of. Uh, the video game example, we don't own any video game companies, but it's interesting. They've all switched to this sort of uh, free, but then pay for additional services type model, which uh, has been very lucrative for them for the last decade. But what it means is they actually are less uh, resilient in a recession than they have been in past recessions because users are just not going to pay as much for those extra services as they might have in the past. And all you had to do is just buy the video game and then you had hours and hours of, uh, of entertainment to, to go off of. So it's gonna be interesting to see how that plays out. Where we're focused is more on enterprise software and you are seeing a deceleration in their customers trying to cut back a bit uh, on how much they're spending for uh, whether it's cloud services or specific types of software they need for their companies.
It's interesting uh, that uh, we have this dichotomy. I read that during a recession, and correct me if I'm wrong, Chance, if your research suggests otherwise, but I read that during a recession, typically people flock to entertainment because I, I guess you're depressed and you have nothing to do. And so you find cheap cheap forms of entertainment, not like, you know, vacations and cruise ships, but you go to the movies more, where you perhaps uh, watch shows a bit more, or, you know, wh whatever forms of entertainment you, you're interested in. Uh, is that a sector that uh, perhaps even, although cyclical as it may be, is that a sector that you think could perhaps do well? It could hold up better than expected. Uh, at the point that you make that it's still cyclical, probably be our main focus. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you might still have a bit more of a fall off in earnings over a difficult uh, economic environment before it rallies back. Uh, I think where you see that more in terms of like affordable luxuries is what you hear that said more mm -hmm. times. Um, uh, Anheuser-Busch InBev just reported and showed that you know, people may not want to buy luxury goods uh, that cost thousands of dollars, but mm -hmm. they may still buy their premium beer that they want to buy because you're talking very minimal purchase. Uh, similarly, that applies somewhat to the beauty market. Uh, McDonald's has talked about that they're actually seeing more traffic because you got people uh, downshifting, but still going to a fast food restaurant like that, whereas maybe they're not going out to eat uh, sit down restaurants as much. So there is a bit of an interplay there, but you have to focus more on the low end of the market uh, that's going to hold up better. Morgan Stanley recently reported that Rolex prices are expected to drop even further. So I don't know if that's an indication of anything, but perhaps that's just a company specific uh, oversupply. But uh, to your point about people not spending as much money on high end luxuries, that's probably one indicator. Uh, finally, how do you feel about gold and precious metals, Chance? Long term, I think we have an interest in always having some exposure to gold and precious metals, uh, especially in our high income strategy that's always trying to uh, grow a little bit faster than inflation through a full cycle. And uh, right now, I think in the short term, this is a difficult environment just because you have the US dollar strengthening and you have real interest rates. So take the 10 year treasury rate uh, against what inflation expectations uh, are for 10 years from now. So not the 8% CPI number you see, but you can actually calculate and they take surveys to see what is expected for inflation a decade ahead. Right now, real interest rates uh, are about as high as they've been in a number of years. That's a tough environment for gold and precious metals to do well. But if you get to a point where a recession really hits home and you see more of a sell-off in the stock market, we would expect long-term treasury rates to eventually come back down like they always do when a recession really takes hold. And that would be an environment where we would expect gold and precious metals to start performing well again. All right, Chance. Excellent thoughts. Thank you very much for joining us today. And uh, I'll look forward to speaking with you next time. Thanks a lot, David.